In this lecture, I'm going to talk about what's probably the most important graph in all of astronomy. This graph sort of sums up everything that you could possibly want to know about different kinds of stars. And it's ridiculously important that you know how to read it, but also how to make one yourself. Um, students who took this course in previous semesters sort of discovered kind of too late. They figured out around the time of the final that being able to make this diagram was really helpful. Being able to use the diagram is really helpful. This is something called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or the HR diagram for short, for obvious reasons. Um, and what it is, is a graph with, on the y-axis, the luminosity of the star, and on the x-axis, the spectral type or the temperature of the star. Uh, this particular version is from your textbook, and you can uh, look at it in your textbook, but you should also uh, try to make a version of it for your notes, or as some of you are doing, take a screenshot, put that in your notes, something like that. But you really need to know this diagram, know how to make one, know how to interpret it. Now, I'm going to zoom in on various things in a, in a minute, but the first thing I want you to notice, because this is the first thing Hertzsprung and Russell noticed when they made it, is that the stars, when you put them on the HR diagram, seem to fall in basically four general regions. Uh, one of them is this sort of diagonal line, and it turns out that 90% of stars fall on this diagonal line, and because of that it's called the main sequence. It's the main place where we find stars. Then in the upper right, we have a section up here that's going to be called supergiants, and another region here called red giants. Um, these are obviously going to be big stars, and the supergiants are really, really, really big stars. And then finally, there's another sort of diagonal line down here that is the white dwarfs. So one thing you might immediately guess is that something on here has to do with size, despite the fact that what we're graphing is luminosity and temperature. Now I'm going to go to the version that shows you all of the details about this now, but again, make sure you've got those four regions down. That is the most important thing you can know, is that there are those four regions on the diagram. So I've now labeled those. There's the main sequence, supergiants, red giants, and white dwarfs. One thing you might want to know is where is the sun on this diagram? And it's right there. It's right in the middle of the main sequence. Now, again, we know that we've got luminosity on the y-axis. So high luminosity, that's where we're going to have bright, intrinsically bright. This is luminosity, not apparent brightness. Um, but bright stars, one's giving off a lot of light up here, faint ones down here, so the sun is kind of in the middle. On the x-axis, I told you that it's temperature, but it's also spectral type. I don't know how well you can see this in what you're looking at, but you can see the spectral types on here. Here we go, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. We should remember that order. And that's how Hertzsprung and Russell initially graphed it. But they did this before the, it was understood what the connection was between spectral type and temperature. They just did a spectral type graph. And what we end up with is a very bizarre sort of thing. When you look at the connection between spectral type and temperature, we end up with hot on the left and cool on the right which is sort of backwards of what you would see on most graphs. On most graphs, we would go in increasing order from left to right. The low numbers, the low temperatures would be over here, and the high temperatures would be over here. But that's not the way it goes. It is backwards in temperature order. We've got hot over here and cool over here. So that's one thing that you really need to remember is that the temperature order on here is backwards. Of course, the sun is a G-type star, so there it is. Now, uh, some other things that you'll want to know. Well, of course, cool stars are redder, so that's why you notice the red giants are all over here towards the right. That's why they are red giants, because they are fairly cool. 
The supergiants cover sort of a range of colors and temperatures, and obviously the main sequence spans the whole range. The white dwarfs, as you can see, are all fairly hot, and so that's why they're white. Um, you could think blue or white somewhere in there, um, but basically they're considered white. Now, another thing that comes on this, and you might guess this already based on talking about giants and dwarfs, is that the size comes in. And if you see these diagonal lines, sort of drawn through here, each diagonal line represents stars with equal radius. And the ones up here have the biggest radius, and then a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, this line is the radius of the sun, there's the sun, and then smaller than the sun and even smaller and smaller yet. So in the upper right hand corner we have stars with large radius, in the lower left hand corner we have stars with small radius. You'll notice that the main sequence is sort of in the middle. They're kind of um, between the sun and maybe this is about ten times the sun and about a tenth of the size of the sun. So within this sort of range they're kind of in the middle. And then the red giants and the supergiants are really big. Supergiants, you can see, are as far to the upper right as we can get. And white dwarfs, as their name suggests, are all pretty small. You'll also notice that the white dwarfs are all kind of the same size as each other. We'll talk about that later, why that's the case. There's one other important thing on here, which is that on the main sequence, and just on the main sequence, this is not true for red giants and super giants and white dwarfs, but for the main sequence, the main sequence is also an order of mass. It turns out that in the upper left hand corner on the main sequence, we have stars that have high mass. These are the most massive stars. Um, you can't see it, but there's a label here for 60 times the mass of the sun. Of course, there's the sun. So these are all more massive than the sun. There's Sirius. It's about two times the mass of the sun. Um, that's a famous one. Alpha Centauri is almost exactly the same as the sun. That's another one you probably heard of. And then down here, we have lower mass. So as you go down the main sequence, the mass decreases. These are stars that have very low mass. That's not going to be true for supergiants and red giants. Supergiants are going to have large mass, red giants can have pretty much any mass, and white dwarfs all have about the same mass for reasons that we'll learn later. Um, so, and they tend to be very small in mass. And finally, it's going to turn out again for reasons that we'll talk about later, that stars that have high mass have short lives. They go through their supply of hydrogen very quickly. They live fast and die hard, we like to say. So the high mass stars have short life, the low mass stars have long life. So any star that's down here is going to have a lifetime longer than the sun. Any star up here is going to have a lifetime shorter than the sun. The sun's lifetime is going to be about 10 billion years. Down here you might get as much as a trillion. Up here you might be as little as 10 million. So uh, very uh, different lifetimes as we go along the main sequence as well. So all of that information is conveyed in this one diagram. You need to know all of that information. You need to be able to immediately look at the placement of a star on the HR diagram and be able to say something about what type of star it is, main sequence red giant, super giant, or white dwarf, be able to say something about how luminous it is, what its temperature is, what its spectral type is, what its radius is, and if it's on the main sequence, then what its mass is and what its lifetime is. All of those things are conveyed on here. Another thing that we're going to learn eventually is that this also tells us something about the lifetime of stars, the way the stars move through their course of life. Of life. A star doesn't stay on the main sequence forever. Supergiants are not just born that way, neither are white dwarfs. There's a process that we move through the HR diagram as a star goes through its life. And that's another thing we'll be talking about as we continue in this unit.